With 3D printers, there's a lot of different products and designs out there, so it can be difficult to know which one's the best for your application. But in today's video, I'm going to go over each type of hot end, its strengths and weaknesses, and why you might pick one over the other. All 3D printer hot ends are composed of six basic parts. You have the nozzle, the heater block, the heating element, the thermistor, the heat break, and the hot end heat sink. Now let's go over each component and explain how it functions, some different design variations, and why you might choose one design over another. Working our way from the bottom up, let's start with the nozzle. 3D printer nozzles come in a couple different shapes and sizes. If we look at our humble Ender 3 hot end, you can see this is the nozzle that it uses. A nozzle's purpose is to direct hot molten plastic down onto your print surface. Basically, hot plastic is fed into the back end, it gets pushed through the nozzle, and it comes out a tiny opening in the tip. Larger diameter nozzles allow you to print faster because you have less resistance to flow as you're extruding plastic out the nozzle. A typical 3D printer nozzle will have a 0.4 millimeter diameter nozzle, and the diameter of the inlet hole will be 1.75 millimeters, which determines what size filament you can feed through it. A nozzle's length determines how long the melt zone is, with the nozzle having a longer melt zone being capable of extruding plastics at higher speeds and at more consistent temperatures. The downside of a longer melt zone is you have less precise extrusion. Because let's say you're extruding a line and say you want to stop immediately. You stop extruding, but there's pressure built up inside of the nozzle. And if you have a large volume of pressurized plastic, it's harder to stop it than if you have a small volume of pressurized plastic. A couple other factors that affect nozzle performance are the tip geometry, the smoothness of the inside bore, and the material that the nozzle is made out of. Brass is the most common material used in nozzles because it's cheap and easy to machine. You can opt for more expensive nozzles that are made out of copper or stainless steel, with copper nozzles being better in terms of their heat transfer rate, so you'll have better control over the temperature of the plastic as you're printing it, and steel nozzles having greater wear resistance, so if you're printing an abrasive material such as carbon fiber, you won't wear the nozzle out so quickly. The smoothness of the inside bore affects your printer's extrusion precision, with a really nice straight and polished bore having the best properties because as you extrude your plastic, it's facing as little resistance as possible. If you have a rougher bore, or a bore that isn't straight, then you'll have more back pressure on your nozzle, so you'll have to push on it harder to get the plastic to come out, and you won't have as much control over the extrusion. These two copper nozzles on the right don't look like they're made out of copper, because they've been nickel plated. It's common to plate nozzles to give them increased wear resistance and increased corrosion resistance, especially with copper, because that tends to oxidize in air. Working our way up on the hot end, we turn our attention from nozzles to heater blocks. The heater block is the part that's responsible for transferring the heat from these heater cartridges into the plastic. On the far left, we have this heater block that's typical of an Ender 3 style design. And as we move to the right, we have different E3D style designs. There's also some non-conventional designs offered by companies like Fetus and Slice Engineering. A standard hot end uses one of these shorter nozzles that has a shorter melt zone, and therefore it has better control over the amount of plastic you're putting down. If you're printing with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, this setup is pretty much ideal, because you really can't put that much more plastic out of a 0.4 millimeter nozzle, unless you have some kind of crazy high-speed 3D printer. However, if you want to experiment with larger diameter nozzles, and you want to print really fast, you might consider switching over to a Volcano-style hot end. The melt zone on this thing is about twice as long, and it does a good job with nozzles that are larger, so 0.6 millimeters and up. My recommendation is to go with a standard heater block if you're planning on printing with a 0.4 millimeter nozzle or below, and to go with a volcano style heater block if you're planning on printing with a 0.6 millimeter or above. Typically, you'll have heater blocks that are made out of aluminum or copper. Sometimes you can get them made out of brass, but I really don't recommend those. Aluminum heater blocks are great if you're just planning on printing at standard speeds, while copper heater blocks are better if you're planning on higher volumetric flow rates or at higher temperatures. Because copper has a higher melting point than aluminum, you can go up to much higher temperatures with a copper heater block. And again, this is a shiny color because it's copper that's been plated with nickel to prevent corrosion. The main advantage of aluminum is that it's much cheaper than copper. Where copper really shines compared to aluminum is thermal conductivity. It has about twice the thermal conductivity as aluminum, that just means that heat is being transferred from your heater cartridge to the rest of your components in the heater block much faster, meaning that you'll have better control over the temperature of your filament as you're extruding it. Two electrical components are installed into your heater block in order to control the temperature. This consists of a heating element and a temperature sensing element. 
The motherboard of your printer runs a PID loop, which controls the temperature of your heater block, just like a thermostat controls the temperature of your house. Heater cartridges are usually described by a voltage rating and a power rating. These ones are nicely marked, so it's easy to tell what they are. But if they're unmarked, you can always just plug them into a multimeter. If you measure its resistance, you can calculate what its wattage is based on your system voltage and the resistance value of the heating element. There's two basic types of temperature sensors, thermistors and thermocouples. Thermistors produce a certain resistance in response to temperature. So as temperature goes up, resistance goes up. It's a portmanteau of thermal resistor. And using a mapping between resistance and temperature, you can figure out how hot something is based on the resistance reading of the thermistor. A thermocouple is made of two dissimilar metals that produce a voltage just like a battery. And the voltage that it produces will be different based on the temperature. Using a mapping between that voltage and the temperature, you can calculate what the temperature is based on the voltage across the thermocouple. Almost all 3D printers use a thermistor style temperature sensor because thermistors are cheap. Thermistors can be packaged as either a glass bead type or a cartridge type. I prefer the cartridge type because it's more robust. With the glass bead type you have these little metal leads that can short out against the heater block and cause some real damage to your system. You just got to be more careful with them when you're putting it together so that you don't short those wires to anything. One of the main advantages of a thermocouple is that it has a much wider operating range. So higher temperature printers will tend to use thermocouples instead of thermistors. If you're looking for a replacement for your 3D printer, it'll probably be a 100,000 ohm thermistor. When purchasing a thermistor, you have to keep in mind that your heater block is designed for one type of packaging or another. So this one is designed for a cartridge style thermistor. And this one is designed for a glass bead style thermistor. So now we've covered everything from the heater block down. The next component up the chain is the heat break. And it's that little gap in between the heat sink and the hot end. So all 3D printers work by melting the plastic and pushing it through the nozzle. But when you design this, you need to decide when it turns from solid into liquid. As plastic is being fed down the hot end, you want it to melt when it gets to the nozzle so that it's extruded as a molten plastic. But if you didn't have a heat break, the high temperatures in the nozzle would work their way back up into the heat sink and higher, and you'd end up with a situation where things get too hot up here and the plastic melts. And if the plastic melts up in this area, when it resolidifies, it'll jam. So you can understand why having a heat break is important. The purpose of the heat break is to separate the hot part of the hot end from the cold part of the hot end. And it does this by building in an area of low thermal conductivity. So you'll have very little heat transfer from this part over into this part. This is usually accomplished by using a thin walled tube. And ideally you want to make this tube out of a material that doesn't conduct heat very well and is very strong. In most cases they're made out of stainless steel, but they can also be made out of titanium which is stronger, lighter, and has an even lower thermal conductivity than steel. So if you consider copper to be your baseline material, aluminum is about half as thermally conductive as copper, and titanium and stainless steel are about a tenth as thermally conductive as aluminum. So that explains why they make heat breaks out of stainless steel or titanium. So here I have a couple different types of heat break. The one installed in this hot end is an all-metal titanium heat break. This one right here is a stainless steel all-metal heat break. And this one is a PTFE lined stainless steel heat break. You can tell the difference between these two by noticing that the all metal heat break has a narrower heat break section than the PTFE lined one. And this component determines whether you have an all metal hot end or a PTFE lined hot end. That's why if you're looking for an all metal hot end, I recommend just changing out the heat break as the cheapest solution. So if we look inside here, you can see this PTFE lining. All right, so now I've extracted the PTFE liner. And the purpose of this PTFE liner is to help deal with friction and retractions. So this PTFE liner reduces the amount of friction inside of the hot end, and that makes it so you can get cleaner extrusion. For an all metal hot end to get similar levels of performance, it needs to be highly polished on the inside. But to me, the main advantage of an all metal hot end is that you don't have to be heating up this PTFE liner to the melting point of whatever material you're using. PTFE really shouldn't be heated up past 220 degrees Celsius, because it'll start to release volatile gases that are bad for your health. So by switching to an all metal hot end, you reduce the occurrence of all those gases. A lot of beginner level printers ship with a PTFE lined heat break because they're a lot easier to use and jam less often. But as soon as you learn how, I'd recommend switching over to an all metal hot end. Just keep in mind that when you switch to an all metal hot end, you're gonna have to reduce your attraction settings. With a PTFE lined hot end, if you pull molten plastic back up into the heat break, 
It's not that big of a deal because there's a PTFE lining that'll be really slick and allow you to push it back out. But with an all metal hot end, you might end up pulling molten material back up into this heat break where it'll solidify and cause a jam. In order to fix it, you might have to take your printer apart and push the jam out, and then you'll be able to resume printing after reassembling. But when you're pushing that jam out, you might scratch up the surface, making it more likely to jam in the future. So you just gotta be careful when you're doing that operation. My advice is to use an all metal hot end with a direct drive extruder so you can turn your attractions down really low, but that's a topic for another video. So in summary, the heat break separates the cold portion of the hot end from the hot portion of the hot end. You can barely see it in there, but it's a really important part of the printer. So here's the hot end from my Vox Lab Aquila that came stock on the machine, and I've kind of dissected it a little bit. You can see here's the nozzle, here's the filament, and here's the PTFE tube. It goes all the way through the heat sink, the heat break, and the heater block. One of the big problems with this design is your PTFE tube is right here inside of the heater block. So it's getting overheated and it'll start to degrade over time. Another problem with this design is that if the tube isn't pressed down all the way against the nozzle, you can have a little area where the plastic melts and just kind of sits in there. So there's this little puck of plastic that's going to cause nothing but trouble. It increases the resistance when you're trying to push filament through the nozzle and it's kind of stagnant material that's just sitting in that hot zone over a long period of time. And you can see that it's changed colors. It's much darker and it's started to degrade. This can eventually get cooked down into little carbon particles that can enter the nozzle and clog it. So you definitely don't want this happening on your 3D printer. You can ensure this doesn't happen by making sure that this PTFE tube is pressed down all the way against the nozzle before you start printing with it. And this is what your typical Ender 3 heat break looks like when it's all assembled. One of my complaints with this design is that you've got these two screws on either side that are transferring heat from the heater block up into this heat sink. So it's not a super efficient design because you're, you've got that little bit of extra heat transfer, but it seems to work well enough for beginner applications. If you want to upgrade to something similar but higher quality, I recommend a Micro Swiss hot end because it's got all around better build quality and everything's just a little bit nicer and you don't have to worry about that PTFE tube getting cooked and producing toxic gases. This Micro Swiss hot end is pretty nice because it all comes in a kit so you don't have to worry about forgetting parts and having compatibility issues. It all just kind of works together. And I've been able to get really good print results out of this thing. If you want to spend a little less money than the Micro Swiss all metal hot end, you can just replace this heat break. So this part alone you can replace with an all metal version and instead of the PTFE tube going all the way down to the nozzle, it'll only go down a couple of millimeters into this heat break. And that'll keep it separated from the hot parts that can degrade the PTFE tube. Okay, so now we get to the issue of hot end compatibility. A stock Ender 3 type machine will have these two mounting holes that are used to mount the hot end heat sink to this carriage. And a lot of other companies are moving to this standard so you can just bolt things onto your Ender 3 and start printing with them. But there's another type of standard mount that's been used called the J-head. And that looks like this. So you can see it's this round shape with an area to clamp onto it. And this style of mount is incompatible with the Ender 3. Unless you use one of these Klemco mounts. So with this Klemco mount, all you have to do is attach it into this two bolt pattern. So now you've converted this Ender 3 to a J-head mount. Now you can see here, I've just installed this Dragon hot end onto my Ender 3. What I like about this Klemco mount is it allows you to have a lot of flexibility with what hot ends you use. So you can use pretty much any hot end that you want. Because when you have the Klemco mount on, you can use this J-head style, and you can just take it off, then you can use these two bolt mount styles. So it's definitely a handy tool to have. There's also a nice community around this Klemco mount, so you can look on Thingiverse and find attachments for fan shrouds, BL touches, and all that kind of stuff. So let me know if there's a product you'd like me to try, or if there's a 3D printing concept you want me to explain or if there's some crazy build that you think I could do. Alright, thanks for watching and I'll see you guys next time.